a little bit early, but a lot to do. <clears throat> We're picking up Act 3, Scene 1, page 1281 in the 11th edition. We had just left off on Monday with um, the beginning of Hamlet's conversation with Ophelia. And I believe where we finished was, or where I'm going to pick up is, Hamlet says, line 14, uh, 15, 14, line 113, I did love you once. She replies, indeed, my lord, you made me believe so. Hamlet, you should not believe me. For virtue cannot so inoculate our old stock, but we shall relish of it. I loved you not. And we talked about what, you know, the virtue inoculating the old stock and what that means, you know, the idea of virtue or redemption of the old Adam, so to speak, okay? Um, making the person new so that they no longer sin and such, okay? So then Hamlet says, I loved you not. So first he said, I did love you once. Now he says, I loved you not. You got to imagine Ophelia's a little confused at this point. I was the more deceived. Okay. Why doesn't she just say I was deceived? Why the more? She liked him more. Louder? She liked him more. Yeah. <laughs> she loved him too. The more implies, man, I I believed you. I Everything you sent me just <sighs> made her flutter. Get thee to a nunnery. What? It's like a non sequitur. How does that follow from, I didn't love you? Get thee to a nunnery. Why wouldst thou be a breeder of sinners? Gets back to the old stock. Okay? If you don't go to a nunnery, if you don't become a nun, you're going to have sex. Maybe you're going to have, get married, then have sex. But you're going to have sex and you're going to breed. Breed. We usually use the term breed in relation to what? Humans? No. We use procreation. They intercourse. Breed is animals, right? So, why wouldst thou be a breeder, a producer? Of sinners. Okay. I don't have time to go into that. Did I did I mention the other day or did I talk at all about this notion? I know I did in my first class. I don't think I did in this class. Saint Augustine of Hippo. Doesn't mean it's a hippo. Hippo was a town in North Africa. This is on page 1281 in the 11th edition. <clears throat> St. Augustine, 4th century, 5th century, I can't remember, bishop, is the one who came up with the notion in the phrase original sin. Okay? Big, major theological idea in the Catholic Church. Okay? Um, and in the Protestant Church. The Orthodox Church doesn't have it at all doesn't use the term original sin at all. And what's meant by original sin, according to Augustine, essentially, is this sinful condition that is passed on to all of humanity from Adam and Eve onward through sex. It's genetic in that sense. Okay? And it is connected to sex. All right? To the extent that in the medieval Catholic Church, Christians were told, Catholics were told, get married, have sex, produce children, but don't enjoy it. Not the having children part, but the creating children. Don't enjoy sex. Kind of a weird idea if you think about it for a little bit. So you're supposed to procreate because Adam and Eve were told, be fruitful and multiply, okay? But you're not supposed to enjoy it, okay? Because that part of it, of sexual intercourse, was sinful. So, 
why wouldst thou be a breeder of sinners? Every time a child is born, that child is born, according to this idea, sinful. So that the medieval Catholic Church said, if the child dies before being baptized, that child automatically goes to hell. Not flames, burning, guys with pitchforks, you know, that kind of hell, but just kind of this boring mid-August kind of day where you just sit around and go, there's just nothing to do, and it's boring, and it's hot. Okay? Not total suffering, but just blah. All right? So, you know, I kind of think mid-August or mid-February, where you haven't seen the sun in a few days, and it's just maybe cold and misty, you know, either one of those. I am myself indifferent, honest, and your gloss there tells you for honest, line, what is that, line 119, moderately virtuous, but honest has already been used to also describe chastity, okay? So maybe it's not moderately virtuous, maybe it's moderately chaste. How can you be moderately chaste? Isn't that kind of like being kind of pregnant? Either you are or you aren't. There's no, no in-between, okay? But yet I could accuse me of such things that it were better my mother had not borne me. Does he mean actual physical things he's done? Does Hamlet have a stack of bodies? You know, in his closet, so to speak? No, he doesn't. He means thoughts. I am very proud, revengeful, ambitious, with more offenses at my back than I have thoughts to put them in, imagination to give them shape, or time to act them in. All right? What should such fellows as I do crawling between earth and heaven? What's his point? Why should we even exist is his point. That's what he's really getting at there. What should such fellows as I do crawling between earth and heaven? Because what's his implication? He says, I am proud, revengeful, ambitious, and I have all kinds of offenses at my back. That is, I can immediately call them out. But I, I don't have time, okay? And I don't have the thoughts to bring them out. So what should I do crawling down here on earth? All these acts. So if you don't go to a nunnery, you're going to produce more what? People like me, full of sin. We are errant knaves all. Errant means misdirected. We don't have a, a goal, a destination. We don't know where we're going. Believe none of us. What kind of statement is believe none of us? Does he say, don't believe some of us? What's the difference between don't believe some of us versus believe none of us? It's, absolute. it's an absolute. So when he says, believe none of us, what's the problem with the statement? It's an absolute statement. What's my point? If it's an absolute statement, and he's saying, don't believe any of us what is included in that statement. Don't believe me either. How can she believe him yet at the not same time not believe him? Do you see what Hamlet's kind of doing? Okay, first of all, he's playing with Ophelia. Polonius said, I'm going to set my daughter loose on him. Like a pack of dogs. Who's really been set loose on whom? I mean, him looks like a cat. And she's just like a mouse. Watch a cat sometime with a mouse. Cruel little buggers. 
because they'll hold the mouse down with the claws out, just barely puncturing. And then they'll let the mouse go. And then what do they do? They pounce again and they pounce again. That's what Hamlet's doing with Ophelia. Why? Does Hamlet hate Ophelia? Did Hamlet hate Ophelia? No, he didn't. Okay? So why does he say believe none of us? This is page 1281, by the way. I think it's Hamlet essentially saying, let me put it this way. I think Hamlet is trying to subtly, with all kinds of nuance, tell Ophelia, don't believe a word I'm telling you. So if he's, if, big, huge if, all right? If he's saying, don't believe a word I'm telling you, what's his real message? The hidden message, the cryptic message to Ophelia. What's he told her twice? He's telling her the opposite of what he's doing. It's the exact opposite of everything he's saying, right? I, he says, love you not. Don't believe a word I say. I, what's the opposite I love you not? It's not past tense. It's present tense. I do love you. Okay? So, go thy ways to a nunnery. So, so again, why go to a nunnery? What do you know about a convent? What do they usually have, first of all, other than nuns and abbesses? It's got a wall around it. Why? protection. What's the protection from? What is outside the wall? Okay. Where's your father? Again, another non sequitur. What does any of this have to do with her father? <coughs> what does she say? At home, my lord. Where is her father? He's behind the heiress. He is positioned in such a way with Claudius that they are listening to everything that is being said. How do we know? Because we're going to be told as soon as Hamlet leaves, when Claudius comes out with Polonius, he's going to say, we heard everything. If they heard everything, then they are on the stage somewhere behind the curtain. Okay? So what has she just done? She lied to her teeth. Does Hamlet know she lied? That's the question. It's not to be or not to be. That's the question. It's, does Hamlet know Ophelia at this point is lying to him? Let the doors be shut upon him that he may play the fool nowhere but in his own house. Does Hamlet think Ophelia is going to take that advice to her father? If not, then why does he say it? Does anybody think Hamlet knows that Polonius and Claudius are spying on him right now? I do. I think Hamlet knows exactly what's going on. What's a possible reason why he knows that? Why is Hamlet walking in this gallery, in this lobby? he was sent for. Somebody told him, Hamlet, you should go to the lobby. Are we told why? No. We're just told that Hamlet was secretly sent for. Hamlet secretly is sent for. Hamlet arrives. He delivers to be or not to be. Ah, oh, the ferrophilia. And if he didn't know before, I think once he sees Ophelia, he knows, to use another Shakespearean phrase, the jig is up. And everything's being kind of orchestrated. So why does he say, let the doors be shut upon him? If Hamlet knows Polonius is watching, what's he telling him? <coughs> 
keep your nose out of my business. I mean, what is the king going to say in just a few lines? Line 181, madness and great ones must not unwatch go. I think Hamlet is telling Polonius, just like he tells Ophelia, go to the nunnery. He's telling Polonius, go to your house and stay there. What's Polonius going to do? In just a few pages, he's going to tell Hamlet, your mother wants to see you. Go now. Hamlet goes. Polonius is in cahoots with Gertrude. He hides behind an heiress to listen. Gertrude thinks at one point Hamlet's going to kill her, and she cries for help. And Polonius, behind the heiress, also cries for help. And Hamlet runs him through. Okay? And says, I took you for your better. You shouldn't have been too busy, meaning a busybody. What was all of Polonius' advice to Laertes about? Mind your own blanking business. Don't get involved in other people's arguments. Don't get involved in other people's affairs. Don't give advice. Don't take advice. You know, well, take other people's censure, all that kind of stuff. So, oh, help them, you sweet heavens, Ophelia cries out. Why? She thinks Hamlet's crazy. If thou dost marry, I'll give thee this plague for thy dowry. So if you don't take my advice and go off to the nunnery and you're going to get married instead, fine, go ahead, do that. Here's what I'm going to give you for your dowry. Notice it's a plague. Be thou as chaste as ice. Word that description that would be used today is, ooh, she's frigid, okay? As pure as snow, thou shalt not escape calumny. Even if you don't consummate your marriage, he's suggesting, guess what's going to happen? People are still going to talk about you. You can have the perfect marriage. People are still going to talk about you. Get thee to a nunnery. Go! It's almost like he's saying, no, right this minute, leave. Why? This whole house of cards, it's going to start crumbling. Farewell. Or, if you will need to marry, marry a fool. Why a fool? For wise men know well enough what monsters you make of them. What are the monsters... Women make of men, cuckolds. In the Middle Ages, it was thought, because women, again, it was thought, because women cannot be sexually satisfied with one man. You know, a guy has sex, he can't get it up again for a couple hours. A woman, she can you know, put a turnstile in, one after the other. Medieval mindset, all right? You see this in Chaucer's Canterbury Tales. Actually told by one of the women characters. Well, it was thought that when a woman cheats on her husband, she puts little horns on his head. That's the cuckold, okay? Men don't want to be cuckolded. So you have, you know, things like chastity belts invented. And men, you know, get all jealous and all that kind of stuff. So he says, if you marry, marry a fool. Why? Because a fool's not going to know the difference. But a wise man will. To a nunnery, go quickly. Oh, heavenly powers, restore him. What's the restore imply? If you restore something, what do you do? If you restore an old car, you make it like it was before, like it was new. In other words, kind of like the language that he used earlier of inoculating the old Adam. Remake it. Make it like it was before. Okay? Hamlet, I've heard of your paintings too, well enough. He doesn't mean paintings like Picasso paintings. He means 
the paintings, your women, the faces you make for yourselves through cosmetics. They had cosmetics then, okay? God has given you one face and you make yourselves another. That is, you're not happy with your face. He's not talking like plastic surgery, remaking yourself. He's saying, you know, there's something about your face you don't like, and so you put some makeup on and you create a little depth, a little texture, you know, you emphasize the cheekbones, all that stuff. And you do what? You make yourselves a different face. Kind of like wearing a mask. You jig, you dance about, you amble, you lisp. These are all supposed sexy attributes, seductive attributes of a woman, okay? You nickname God's creatures and make your wantonness your ignorance. And you've got a gloss down there. You excuse the want, your wantonness on the ground of your ignorance. What's meant by wantonness? Your sluttish behavior. Oh, I didn't know any better. Go to. I'll know more on it. That is, I'm, I'm not going to talk about it anymore. It hath made me mad. Oh, he used the word. I'm crazy. It hath, your behavior hath made me mad. Now, the you specifically here is Ophelia. Hmm. I say, we will have no more marriage. Uh, not anymore. Those that are married already, all but one shall live. Who's the all but one? Claudius. If everybody else that's married, that's fine. You're going to be. But one married person is going to die. The rest shall keep as they are to another Go. How many times has he said, get thee to an unary? It's got to be close to a half dozen by this point. It's several times. Hamlet leads. Ophelia is on the stage. Is she alone? Her little speech ends with enter King and Polonius. Oh, what a noble mind is here overthrown. The courtier soldier scholar's eye, tongue, sword. That means it's an interesting construction. The courtier's eye, tongue, sword. The soldier's eye, tongue, sword. The scholar's eye, tongue, sword. She's saying Hamlet, he is the model. He is the epitome of the courtier, the soldier, the scholar. What's that, What's that mean then? This is the perfect man, okay? This is the man every other man wants to be. They want to be like Hamlet. And this is the man every woman wants. The glass of fashion, the glass means a mirror. So people look at Hamlet, men look at Hamlet and they go, I want to look like him. I want to dress like him. That's the fashion part. The mold of form, they look at his body, how he wears his clothes, not the clothes themselves. They mean physique, stature, and go, it's not fair. I should look like that too. The observed of all observers. Hamlet lives metaphorically in what? A fishbowl. Everybody else is on the outside looking in. What's that telling us about everybody? Seemingly, at least in Elsinore. Everybody's looking at everybody else. What does nobody seemingly do? This is a, a, a society as the, as the panopticon, the all-seeing, where everybody's looking at everybody else. And she tells us, Hamlet, he's the center of that. Why? 
There's, there's actually, in her comment there, on the surface level, there's nothing negative about it. Why is he the observed of all observers? Because he's the apex. He's the highest, the greatest, the most wonderful, the most beautiful, the smartest, the greatest warrior there is. Okay? That's why everybody looks at him. But then there's also the subtext. In a society of spies, he's the one most spied upon. And I, excuse me, quite, quite dim. What's happened to, what's happened to Hamlet, according to Ophelia? He's fallen from that perch. Okay. Hamlet is going to use this, this imagery of kind of falling or going from the highest of one thing to the lowest of something in his conversation with his mother in her bedroom. Because he's going to compare his father, Hamlet Sr., with the highest, with her current husband, Claudius, the lowest. And I, of ladies, most deject and wretched. Why is she most deject and wretched? That is most dejected, most depressed. Next line. That sucked the honey of his music vows. Because who heard Hamlet's vows? Ophelia did. Hamlet wasn't, you know, spreading his wild oats around all of Elsinore. She's suggesting he really loved me. Notice, his vows were what? Music and honey. Sweet and pleasing to the ear. Now I, get to the rest of the sentence, now see that noble and most sovereign reason, like sweet bells jangled, out of time and harsh. Okay. His vows were what? Music. And the music is now out of time. It's discordant. What did Hamlet tell after the scene with the ghost before the next act began? Oh, cursed me that time is out of joint. A cursed spite that time is out of joint and that I was born to make it right. She just said it again out of time and harsh. That unmatched form and feature of blown youth blasted with ecstasy. 151. Blown. Blooming. She's suggesting Hamlet hasn't even yet reached his peak. He was nipped in the bud. She's going to use the phrase in just a moment where she's already she's already used it the expectancy and rose of the fair state hamlet is like a rosebud that is not fully opened and what has happened clipped blasted with ecstasy again ecstasy soul kind of leaving the body here reason has left the building and Hamlet's just crazy. Oh, woe is me to have seen what I have seen, see what I see. First half of that. To have seen what I have seen. When was that? In the past. What has she seen in the past? Hamlet. When everybody wanted, either wanted him or wanted to be like him. That's what she remembers seeing. Now, to see what I see. Have you ever looked upon someone? Have you ever known someone who, you know, seemingly had everything great and then suddenly, like a house of cards, it just all falls apart and the person ends up as a nobody? I mean, the last 20 years, can't tell you the number of stories I've read 
about people who had been hedge fund managers, stockbrokers, millionaires, and are living on the street. Because stock crisis of 2008, you know, lost everything kind of it. That's what she's suggesting is going on with Hamlet. King and Queen come, King and Polonies come in. Love? <laughs> no, that's not love. His affections do not that way tend. Not what he speak, though it lacked form a little. Form, he means it lacked kind of rhetorical composition. Yeah, he sounded a little off. What's his point? That was not like madness. Claudius' point is, oh, that's dangerous. Hamlet's thinking of something. There's something in a soul or which is melancholy sits on brood. And I do doubt, that is, I expect the hatch and the disclose will be some danger. His melancholy, his depression, is sitting on something in his whole soul like a hen sits on eggs. Well, what are those eggs going to do at some point? They're going to start hatching. And he's saying, when that thing hatches, it's going to be dangerous. Which to prevent, he said, what is going to happen to Hamlet? We're going to ship him off to England. Why? Collect a tribute that's due to Denmark. Different venue, some nice sea air, different environment. Maybe it'll bring him back to himself. Okay? Polonius, good idea. I still think it's love. I still think he's this way. Because of neglected love. Who's neglected love? Ophelia's. Why is her note love neglected? Because Polonius stuck his nose where it doesn't belong. Favorite theme in Shakespeare? A favorite, not the favorite. There is no the favorite. A favorite theme in Shakespeare is fathers getting in the way of their daughter's love. Why? Because the father doesn't want to lose the daughter. It's it. Okay? So, he says, what? Do as you want, Polonius says to the king. Go ahead, send Hamlet away. But, after the play that we're going to see, let his mother entreat him to show his grief. I'll be placed, so please you, in the ear of all their comforts. So why did we have the little scene with Ophelia again between Hamlet and Ophelia? Because Polonius said, I will set loose my daughter on him. And in doing so, he did what to Ophelia? He turned her into what? Bait, a pawn, okay? Now he's going to do what? Or another way of putting it, he turned Ophelia against Hamlet. Now he's going to do what? He's going to do the same thing with Hamlet's mother. Ophelia has no blood relation to Hamlet. His mother, it's his mother. Okay? So, the king says, go ahead. Madness in great ones must not unwatch go. Why not? What can great ones do? Great things. Nobody in here likes Hitler, right? Any secret neo-Nazis? I don't think so. Kind of dangerous I, that I should raise that because my first year here, I got on something about neo-Nazis and racism, white supremacy and stuff. And I actually had a student write a paper about the, the, the unholy triumvirate of Stalin, Hitler, and Abraham Lincoln. Yeah, kind of rolling your eyes back to that one. This guy was from Virginia. Tidewater. I mean, he's probably KKK. So, what's my point? Why bring up Hitler? Was Hitler great? Yes, he was. Bad, evilly great, but great. How so? What could Hitler do that very few people can do, even very few politicians. 
How? How did he do it? How did he get the people of Germany to follow him? Did he come right out in the open and go, let's kill all the Jews. Let's kill all the gays. Let's kill all the gypsies. Let's kill all the Christians. No, he didn't. What did he do? He talked about Deutschland, Deutschland, Uber, alles. Germany, Germany, overall. Let's rise up as a... He gave speeches. What was one thing Hitler could do that really nobody else comes close? Reagan doesn't come close, and Reagan was the great communicator. Bill Clinton doesn't come close. Obama doesn't come close. All great communicators. Hitler had a power in his charisma. That's why you don't let great ones with those kinds of abilities, which is why you should be, you know, a little skeptical of Reagan's, Clinton's, Obama's, etc., because of the power of their oratory. Okay? Notice, you know, both sides, it doesn't matter what your politics are. So, Hamlet comes in with the players. And I'm not going to spend any time on this other than to say, most scholars, critics, readers of Shakespeare, when they read this little passage between Hamlet and the players, see Shakespeare talking. Because what's he telling the players? He says, speak the speech as I wrote it. Don't go on with all this wild, like I do in class, with all this wild gesticulating. Don't do all these hand movements. That's probably Shakespeare telling his other actors in the Lord Chamberlain's men, you guys, tone it down. My words have power. You don't have to overact. Okay? He also says one other thing about plays. What is the purpose of playing, of plays, of drama? Louder? Entertainment? That's what we think it is. That's not what Hamlet says. Hamlet says is to hold a mirror up to nature. Meaning, look at yourself. Look at yourself. To everyone in the audience. We are to see, according to Hamlet, ourselves on that stage. How so? Is there somebody kind of likable on that stage? Well, we kind of think, that's me. Is there a fool? That's you. <laughs> Is there an idiot? That's you. Is there, in other words, we don't want to see ourselves. But the play is designed exactly to do that, to show us that if I were in that situation, guess what? I would be Oedipus, or I would be Crayon, or I would be Tiresias. It's in a tragedy to identify with the tragic hero. It's why, you know, Harry Potter is so popular. Even though it's not a play, we identify with the character of Harry Potter itself. Not many people identify with Voldemort. There are some, Sickos, you know, but because there are real Voldemorts in our world. Read about them all too often. Okay? So, everybody else comes in. Rosencrantz, Gildenstern, the king, the queen, Polonius, etc. Horatio. And um, they're getting ready to watch the play within the play. And Hamlet tells Horatio, line... 50, 50, line 52. I've never emphasized this before until the other day in my first class. Actually, I talked about this in this class. Have I been going over stuff we talked about the other day? Please tell me now. Okay. Hmm, interesting. I'm a moment of deja vu here. Um, Hamlet says to Horatio, since my dear soul was mistress of her choice and couldn't men distinguish her election, she has sealed thee for herself. For thou hast been as one in suffering, all that suffers nothing. A man of fortunes, buffets, and rewards has taken with equal things. So what is he talking about? His words here kind of echo something that Polonius told his son Laertes. He says, since my dear soul was mistress of her choice and could have been distinguished her election, that is her choice, she 
sealed thee for herself. He's not saying, I love you like my erotic, homoerotic, romantic lover. He's saying, since my soul got to the age that it could choose friends for itself, she's chosen you, Horatio. Why? Because he likes Horatio? No. Because thou hast been as one, like compassion, suffering with, thou hast been as one in suffering all that suffers nothing. Horatio hasn't suffered the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune that Hamlet has. But because of his friendship with Hamlet, he's borne it with Hamlet. He suffered with Hamlet. He's not suffered it personally. What did Polonius tell Laertes? When you make a friend, do what? Try that friendship. In that friendship tried, meaning proven, then do what? Tie that person or bind that person to your soul with steel hoops. Don't choose fair weather friends who are going to leave when the weather gets rocky, when the weather gets bad. In other words, when the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune buffet you, okay? Hamlet's doing that. He's saying, Horatio, I can trust you no matter what, okay? This is gonna be important later on. That's why I wanted to spend a few moments. So everybody else comes in and Hamlet's mother says, Hamlet, come sit next to me. Bottom of page 1285. Hamlet, line 95. No good mother, here's metal more attractive. What does he mean metal? He's talking about like steel and magnets. What do magnets do? They attract steel. What's the attraction? Ophelia. He says, no mother, this is more attractive. Polonius, did you see that? See, because Polonius is still thinking, it's love. Hamlet, lady, shall I lie in your lap? Lies down at Ophelia's feet. Ophelia, no, my lord. Because Ophelia takes Hamlet's words literally. Lady, may I lie, get horizontal in your lap? No. And maybe she means not here, later. You know, if you've seen Kenneth Branagh's version of the Hamlet play, I mean, Hamlet and Ophelia, it's like every opportunity they have, they're, you know, the two-back monster. He said, no, 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 you, don't misunder you misunderstand me. My head upon your lap. Because he's already laying down next to her. He's saying, can I put my head in your lap? Head, yes, double entendre. Again, if there's a pun, especially if there's a sexual pun or innuendo, Shakespeare's going to go for it every time. Why? Dirty mind? Yeah, maybe. Why else? Think of his audience, okay? This is the yard. This is where the groundlings sit, or stand, excuse me, groundlings, okay? Around here are the seats, the three levels of the galleries, all right? These people, generally, very little education. These people, the intellectuals, the well-educated, the upper class, okay? These people, there's really two kinds of humor you aim for to please them. Because if you don't please them, they're gonna pick up the crap, literally the crap, on the ground and throw it at you. Because they relieve themselves during the play. Just drop the britches and let it rip, okay? So, lo what's called low comedy slapstick, think, um, not the three musketeers, the three stooges, poking guys in the eye, slapping them in the head, that kind of stuff. Physical humor, okay? What else? Sexual humor, all right? Is gonna have these people rolling on the ground laughing. 
And a lot of people in these stands or in the galleries are going to go, oh, that's so crude. Well, I can, we all have intellectual humor. A lot of it is also intellectual. Okay? So, I mean, my head upon your lap, that is, I, my Lord, I knew exactly what you meant. Both meanings, again, of word head. Hamlet, do you think I meant country matters? And I hate to even think of looking at the gloss. 101. With a body pun. <coughs> Damn idiot. What's the body pun? When I was working on, we did my doctor was part of this. Big long title. The very warm edition of the poetry of John Donne. John Donne's a poet we're going to read in a few weeks. 17th century poet, contemporary of Shakespeare, probably knew Shakespeare, okay? Whenever Donne used the word country in a poem, in the manuscripts that survived from that period, none of which are in his hand, I've looked at, I don't know, probably a hundred of these, many of them in person, gone to libraries and, and archives and such, 90% of them, I would say, spell the word country, country. And sometimes, literally, I'm not kidding, sometimes it's where this part of the word comes to the end of a line and the RY is like hyphenated and the RY begins the next half line, okay? Yeah, Shakespeare's punning on that. Do you think I meant country matters, sex matters? I think nothing, my lord. Nothing in Shakespeare's day is pronounced like noting. Like I'm noting this, I'm noting that, okay? I think noting, my lord. Hamlet, that's a fair thought to lie between maid's legs. What is my lord? Nothing, noting. So Hamlet says, <laughs> that's a nice idea to lie between maids. What are you talking about? He says, nothing. In reply to her, nothing. Well, how do you represent nothing? Zero, right? What's a zero? It's a circle and a hole. Again, down here, they're slapping each other on the back, spitting up their beer, just rolling on the ground laughing, while those up here are going, oh, that's so crude. Johnny, cover your ears, you know. So, Ophelia, you're very, my lord, like Hamlet, how many did you have before you came into the room? I, my lord, and so they talk back and forth, and so I'm gonna skip a bunch. We get to play within the play. It's called what? Two different names for it. The murder of Gonzago and the mouse trap. Something is going to be trapped, okay? And what do we see, page 1289, happened in the play within the play? And notice, Hamlet gives commentary. We see a mime action. One guy comes in, he goes to sleep on this bench in an orchard. And the other guy comes in, his brother, and he pours poison in his ear. Okay, Hamlet explains what happens. And the king gets up. Hamlet, what? Frighted with false fire. In other words, a mere action, a mere play. How fair is my lord, says the queen. Give me some light, away! And the queen king gets up and he rushes down the building. Yes? You said that they had two names, murder and Gonzaga, and what? The mousetrap. Um, line 214, the king asks what he called the play, the mousetrap. And earlier, er, not earlier, earlier, it was called um, the murder of Gonzaga. Okay. The murder of Gonzago apparently based on a kind of a real story. So, everybody leaves but Hamlet and Horatio. And Hamlet says to Horatio, line 259, didst perceive? Did you see what happened? Very well, my lord. 
on the talk of the poisoning, I did very well note him. Okay. In income, Rosencrantz and Guildenstern and the players with the recorders. What are Rosencrantz and Guildenstern there for? What have they come to tell Hamlet? Takes them a long time to get to it. Queen wants to talk to you, okay? I'm skipping a bunch. Line 280. The queen, your mother, in most great affliction of spirit, has sent me to you. So she's troubled. And Hamlet says, you are welcome. You are welcome? How does that respond to what Gildensburg just said? You are welcome, you usually say after what? Somebody says, thank you, you're welcome. He hasn't deserved a welcome. Okay? Uh, stop. So they go back and forth, and finally, we're told, 296, she desires to speak with you in her closet ere you go to bed. It's taken 15 lines to get that out. Hamlet, okay. So, they ask Hamlet specifically what is wrong. Line 301. Rosencrantz, good my lord, what is your cause of distemper? The word distemper is used here because it was used earlier to describe the king. Line 271. In his retirement, that is, the king has gone off to his room, he is marvelous distempered. Not distemper like a disease. Distempered what? Out of temper? What one word would we use today that describes it? Starts with P, ends with D. Pissed. The king is angry. I mean, smoke coming out of his ears. Okay? So, what's the cause of your now distemper? Why are you out of sorts, Hamlet? Come on, tell us. I like advancement. Why does he say I like advancement? The last time we had a long conversation with Rosencrantz and Gildenstern, they talked about what? They brought up, oh, you like, I don't know what it is. It's your ambition. It's because your ambition isn't filled. Hamlet, I like advancing. Meaning, I should be king. And they're like, what do you mean you like advancement? The king has already publicly said, you're next in line. Hamlet's position, of course, should be what? I should be king now. Okay. So, the players come in with the recorders. Hamlet grabs one. And he takes it to... Gildenstern. It says, will you play upon this pipe? I cannot. I pray. I can't. I beseech you. It's almost like he drops down on his knees and begs him. I, I don't know the touch of it. Well, Hamlet says, it's as easy as lying. Right? Everybody lying is what? Like second nature. Hamlet says, here, look. You take it. You put your mouth here, you put your fingers on these holes, you put your thumb on this hole down here, and you blow, and you make wonderful music. I cannot command, these cannot I command to any utterance of harmony. I have not the skill. Why, look you now how unworthy a thing you make of me. And if I were directing it, him would pop him on the head. Why? Because Hamlet is going to say, you are trying to do what? You're trying to govern my stops. Okay? You're trying to bring out the music I have in me, not literal music, but what? What is in my heart? You're trying to play me like one of these recorders. And he says, whoa, whoa, whoa. and I have music in me. In other words, and if I were to reveal what's in me, Though you fret, though you can fret me, you cannot play upon me. Hamlet is telling us, what does he know? He knows they're spies. Polonius comes in. 
like Polonius has had a conversion. How do, how do I mean that? He speaks clearly and directly for once. My lord, the queen would speak with you and presently. That is, now. I'm going to ask a question again. How old is Hamlet? He sounds young, right? This guy can come in and go, go see your mother right now. Hamlet starts talking about the shape of a cloud. It's like, do, 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 do. And he's not really there. Everybody leaves and Hamlet talks about himself and his mother before going to see his mother. And what does he tell himself not to do? Don't be like Nero. Nero, ancient Roman emperor. Why? Because Nero killed his mother. Hamlet's telling us, because this is a soliloquy. Part of him, he wants to off mom. Because mom made him angry. All right? We'll stop there. We'll pick up with scene three. I didn't quite get to where I wanted to. Never seem to. Um, on Friday. I'm gonna, at the very least, try to get through the rest of Act 3 on Friday.